rhythm and light. Can you believe it's already week number three? Maybe you just showed up to church like week three? What happened to week one and two? Well, if you missed the past couple weeks, if you haven't been with us, that's all right. This is going to be uh, still fitting for your time. Uh, you can go on our website or our app to go pick up the other ones, but just give you a brief summary. Uh, week number one, we talked about how we as the church can be the light into a very dark place. Week number two, we talked about how God's making a platform just for you and how he's making you to fit inside of that platform so that you can take the people who are right in front of you and love on them and serve them. And, and uh, week number three is today. It's right here. We're talking about how we can use our words. Come on, somebody. Our words to make a difference in someone's life. I don't know about you, but I'm realizing more and more how important and powerful words really are. I mean, with words, you can, you can start a war. With simple words, you can divide nations. But with the same words, you can also unite a marriage. You can have some powerful things happen within just the simple confines of the speaking of your tongue. Although we just spit them out sometimes haphazardly and we don't think and we don't run through any kind of a filter, we can do some big damage with words as well. Proverbs 18 says, with the tongue, with the mouth, with your words, you can choose to bring life or bring death. And there's a big difference between the two, but the words are in the idea where we can hold both what will build somebody up or break them down. Ephesians 4 says this, do not let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth. If you have uh, Ephesians 4 up there, can you bring it up? I want to show you this. Do not let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth, only for what is helpful for building others up. Building others up. Do your words build others up? I love this second part because it's going to allow you to think about whether your words actually build up. It says, um, only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that those who hear it may benefit. Now, you know if your words coming out inside of your marriage, you know the words that are coming out inside of your child rearing, you know the words that are coming out inside of your place of influence, maybe at your work or at your gym, you know if they build up because you choose words that are helpful for them based on their need. Do you, do you see the difference? A lot of times we just talk because we have things running through our minds. There's a big difference between actually listening to somebody and putting in words that fit their need. You want to help a conversation out? Listen to what's happening inside of your marriage, inside of the confines of your family, inside of your kids, inside of your coworkers, so that you can hear where the need is, and then you can speak into that need. That will help people be built up. Not broken down, but built up. That is taking the opportunity with our mouth, with our words, to speak life instead of death. And when we do this, we have to know that, that with these small, tiny words, with the small idea of our tongue, we can see momentous things, impossible, miraculous things happen. A marriage changed, families shifted, a city filled up with truth and hope and stories that actually bring life into God's town. Imagine what that would be like if our city would completely be filled with life-giving words. And it starts in the church. Where the church goes, the city goes as well. So may it be that we are a family who start inside of what we listen to, inside of our conversation, so that we can take those to the streets and actually give life-giving words based on their needs so that they can benefit to those who hear. I want to talk about the, uh, the idea of us living with this rhythm and light with the ability to use our words. And I want to use a, a, a text, a story uh, from Matthew 14. So if you travel over to Matthew chapter 14, we're going to be talking about the story of the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000. I want to use this as a template to kind of use so that we can see what our job is, what our role is as individuals, so that we can actually go out into our city, into our place of influence, and feed the people that are hungry. Have you ever fed the hungry? Have you ever fed hungry people? Have you ever been to a homeless shelter and just, and just dished out soup or, or stale bread or just the course of a meal that, that you might not even eat? But the thing about feeding the hungry is they are so hungry. And it's, it's fun. I don't know about you, but it is fun to feed the hungry. 
It's, it's the difference between feeding the hungry is a difference between, have you ever seen waiters and waitresses at a restaurant of a really high upscale uh, five course meal type of restaurant? I mean, these guys are like professionals. Now you don't want, you don't want to drop a crumb. You know, you got to make sure that, that, you know, the fork is properly placed, elbows up, pinkies out. It comes up 90 degrees out. And you feel like people are staring at you like you're eating like a slob. You know what I mean? Like when you're at a high-end restaurant, everything needs to be crisp and clean, including your outfit. And if it's not, you feel like people are staring at you. The fact that I'm not a millionaire makes me think like I don't belong here. You know what I mean? But it's totally different because when you go into a place where you're hungry and you're feeding the hungry, come on somebody, it's a life-giving, freedom-bound, grace-filled atmosphere, isn't it? So should the church be. So come on, let's not be stiff-necked. Let's not be professionals. Let's not go in there and crisp and clean the outside. Let's be hungry people where if that's a word, I'm taking it. If that's truth, I'm eating it. If that's what God is saying, I'm going to devour it. So that we can have this realization where there is a buffet out before us. There is a big God, plenty to go around. So much word that is for you and you and hopelessness will be found in the hope-filled words of God so that we can all be satisfied and what God's saying. So here we are, here we are. Let's get into the, uh, into the message. Here it is, so Jesus just gets some, uh, some really devastating news. John the Baptist just dies, and it says in verse 13, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And when the crowds heard about it, they followed him on foot into the town. And when they went to shore, he saw the great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples had come in And they said, this is a desolate place. The day is now coming to an end. Evening is here. Send the crowds away to the villages to buy some food for themselves. And Jesus said, they need not to go. Why don't you give them something to eat? Well, they said, well, we only have five loaves of bread, two fish. And he said, well, bring them. And he ordered the, uh, the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking five loaves, two fish. He looked up into heaven, blessed it. He took the loaves and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. Everybody had their fill and they ate and were satisfied. You got to love that. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. Those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. 5,000 plus women and children. That's a big crowd. It's a really big crowd. Five loaves and two fish was the beginning of that story. But just before that, there was a conversation that took place. The crowds had showed up. Jesus was trying to have some me time. You ever been like that? You just need to get away. You have some devastating news. I just want to be alone. And your phone rings. A text comes through. Someone knocks at your door that you just can't ignore. You think, okay. Now, usually it's, it's with criticism that we respond, but Jesus responds with compassion. I need to be alone, but you are in a worse place than me. You've got no pastor. You've got no leader. You've got no one looking over your soul. You are hungry, and I've got compassion on you. And it says they healed all the sick that were there. And then, read the story. I'm not making this up. And then, after some amazing day happened, then near evening, then the disciples show up. Come on, where were the disciples before that? You know, you goofing around yet again. Who knows what they were doing? But we can assume some stuff. And so then they showed up. And then all of a sudden, the first thing that they say is they pick through the crowd. They find Jesus and say, we have a suggestion. You know, the 12 of us, we've been talking. We're pretty wise because we're hanging out with you. We think that you can just let them go home. Just send them off on their way. They're hungry and they need to go get food. Food's not here, so send them out. So I'm wondering, how did you actually know that these guys were hungry? Because I don't take it from this reaction that they were like really people oriented. My take is that whenever people are hungry, you can tell. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes whenever you need to eat, you get critical. Who, who, who are those in the room? Come on, let's just be honest. Where when you get hungry, you get angry. So we call you hangry. Come on, anybody, when you just like snap at somebody, you just like, boom, you throw out some words that you didn't even know existed, and you're thinking, sorry, it's been a long time since I've had my protein. You know what I mean? Like, come on, just toss them a Snickers bar and let it be. We just need to get to the point where we realize there are some, there are honestly some byproducts. There's some, there's some symptoms of us being hungry. 
But, but there's another level that goes deeper than that. It's hungry of the soul. And this is exactly what Jesus is getting to. I'm gonna feed the 5,000 with physical food, but can I make a correlation to the thing that I really want you to get? Hunger when it comes to your soul. We, we, can, we can identify hungry when it comes to physical exertion, but at the same time, have you ever noticed what it looks like whenever somebody else is spiritually hungry? It's, uh, it's the fact that they're closed off to God. That, that's when you know they're hungry and they're needed. They don't go to church. That's awesome. They are hungry for God. When they don't speak life. You want to know how I know that? It's because Proverbs 18 has this to say. With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. Can you put that up? Proverbs 18. With the fruit, the byproduct, with the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied satisfied. What does that mean? That means whenever I speak criticism to you and I tear you down, it's not because of you. It's just the only thing that I can find in here. Come on, you ever been there? You ever just get like the blunt end of some criticism, the blunt end of somebody tearing you down, the blunt end of someone's bad day, and you just get ripped to shreds. And you're thinking, I literally just walked in the door. What in the world happened? Here's what's happening. This person is eating the fruit of what's coming out of their mouth. Meaning what you put in is at some point in time gonna come out. But what you speak is actually just a declaration of the condition of your soul. So the ones who need the word of God most, the ones who need life-giving, grace-filled words from you are the ones that are spitting criticism at you right now. Those are the ones that are waiting for you to engage them, not on their turf, but on a different level. See, they want you to speak at them what they want, but what you need to speak to them is what they need. They want you to go toe-to-toe and argue with them. Don't do that. Don't answer a fool in his folly. What you need to do is just come with patience and grace because a soft anger turns away wrath. I'm going to speak life. Maybe you just need to ask them questions instead of making statements. Maybe, Maybe the best speaking of life you can do is just listening with your ears, with your body, with your soul, and you can listen because listening actually displays the need in somebody else. That's what Ephesians 4 says. And when you see the need, you can then speak to that need. And if they're listening, they will benefit. Come on, you catching this? We need to speak life into situations all over the place. People are hungry. Can I tell you the condition of your city right now? I don't even know where your city is. It could be the medical arena. Uh, it could be at a hardware store. It could be a, as an employee uh, up to the, uh, the gym. Uh, it could be owning your own business. You could work in the car. You could work in the education arena. I don't know where you work, but I'll tell you right now, the condition of your city is this right here. There is a famine for the word of God. There's a famine. Look at Amos chapter eight. There's a famine. There's a scarcity. There is a limitation. Not of food, not of water, but for the truth of God. People out in your place of influence are needing God's word truly, lovingly, humbly spoken to them. They don't need another business idea. They don't need other leadership tips. They need great people who have great character to lead the way. God is waiting for us to be listeners of his word so that we can tuck it down, so that we can go out into our city and actually give what it is we have first received. Life-giving, healing words, grace-filled words, words that make a difference. So what that means is Ephesians 4 We need to stop speaking unwholesome language. We need to stop speaking corrupt words. So when we get to the point, we just need to acknowledge that's not of God, but I will speak what is from God. I remember looking through this idea of our tongue and our mouth and our words uh, are either full of life or full of death. I remember listening to this particular proverb in chapter 18. And one of the things that I first recalled was um, when I was a child, Uh, raised from uh, my mom. I remember spending so much time with them because my parents were divorced and I was hanging out with my mom a lot. And she would constantly say this whenever she would see or meet new people. She would say, I'm just really not good with names. I'm just not good with names. She would come up to someone and say, hey, how are you and your kids doing? She's like, I don't have kids. Oh, (laughs) sorry. What was your name again? Constantly. Then she'd go off 
conversation would be done, and she would tell me, I'm just not good with names. I'm just not. So, so what happened with this guy growing up, and then all of a sudden I start teaching tennis, and I see a whole lot of people actually right before me, private lessons, group lessons, a whole lot of members who are paying me to teach them, and then I'd see them out into the community, and they say, hey, Ryan, and I say, hey, dude, that I see five times a week, but I don't know your name. <laughs> so awkward. Knowing someone's name can be really, really personal. And so I stopped speaking that thing over me. I'm actually really good with names. I'm good at actually putting faces with names. I can meet you once. I can put a face to a name because I'm visual and I can remember your name. So when it comes to that, we just need to know what is actually killing your mentality when you go around just thinking of things. What are you speaking death over? Do you go, do you go to work and think, oh, it's Monday? Or do you think, man, I thank God that it's Monday because I've got a job and he provides for me and I got people that I love working with. They're not all like me and we need to get along with There's some stuff that we need to work out, but it's Monday. This is brilliant. That means I just came off from a restful weekend and I get to jump in and pour into some people's lives. We need to change what we speak of, but we first need to change what we think of. And when we have that, when we start speaking life into situations, everything changes. You know, this happens the same, the same way around parenting. Come on, any parents in the house? Any parents? Any parents? I appreciate parents. Just love some parents. Um, we, uh, we are parents of two amazing kids, a three, uh, three-year-old boy, Hudson Roman, and a six-year-old, Emery Eve. It's our daughter. And uh, I remember whenever we had Emery, and she was about maybe one or maybe an infant, and, uh, and we were talking to other parents, and they had older kids, and, and we would say, yeah, you know, our, ours is an infant, nine months, a year old, whatever, and they would say, well, just wait till you get to twos. And they, they do one of these, mm, 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 sorry for you. And so here we are thinking, I'm, I'm sort of scared to step into the twos. Is my child going to blow up? Like... <laughs> Are they all of a sudden just going to get some dirty language and be like, ba 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 bow you know, like tear me down? I just, I, I almost was like, my wife and I was talking about, we just tentatively stepped into the terrible twos until we thought words are life-giving. Let's not speak that over our kids. Twos are going to be a good year. It's going to be a formative year. Yes, it'll be difficult, but we're going to get through this with joy. Our daughter's going to be a joy. Our son's going to be a joy. Has there been hard times? Absolutely, because you're a parent. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you actually breathe and accept and eat of the fruit that you speak over your kids. So now, every time they go to sleep, we just speak words of life over them. I mean, every single day, every single week, we, we pray together, we read books together at night, and then we just sit there and we just say, I, I tell my, my son, he's three, and he's sort of arrogant right now because he's three, but I say, um, I say, buddy, you know you're smart. And he goes, uh-huh. And I was like, you know you're strong? Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, yeah. He hears this stuff all the time. He's like, yeah, yeah, dad. I know, I know, I know. I'm good. Yeah, I know. I'm so proud of you. I know that too. But there is going to be a point where he's going to be seven, eight, or nine where that's going to be shaky. Other people are going to tell him something different. And you know what? He's going to come back to our family, to his parents, and say, what were those words that I need to hear again? Come on, kids, parents, coworkers, employees, bosses, we need to start speaking life into situation. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we just go off and be Mr. Positive all the time. Hey, it's sunshiny. No, it's raining, bro. No, no, the sun's shining somewhere. No, no, don't be that guy, all right? <laughs> Call it for what it is. Okay, truth. Can I tell you something? Truth is very life-giving, but sometimes it's hard to swallow. We, we were on an excursion not so long ago. We were, on a, uh, we were doing some quail hunting, and this guy said, um, he said something about the collar that was on the dog. And he said, uh, yeah, the dog goes through training. He needs to listen, whatever. And he said this. So don't, don't laugh at this. I'm just going to let you know. This is not a joke. I'm just telling you a real situation. He says, um, I wish that my girlfriend would listen like this dog would. I would love to have a collar for my dog, also for my girlfriend. And so here, here's what's going on in my mind. Do you want to marry somebody sometime, soon, anytime, soon? <laughs> start by not speaking that over your girlfriend. Actually, start by not thinking of correlating your girlfriend with your dog. <laughs> I'm just going to help you out. Man to man, stop. You know? 
we're hunting, we're outside, we're doing some manly stuff, but that, that's a bunch of trash and this has got to go. We need to actually find words that are life-giving and bring them to an audience that wants to know how to speak to each other. And, and guys, come on, we're in a famine. Your people are waiting out there for you to speak. They know that you get up early and spend time with God and they're waiting for you to come into work and to speak to them in a patient, life-giving, hope-filled way. They know that you go to church on Sunday. So when you go out to eat after this, big, big tip goes on the table. Speak life into them and let them make the connection. I wanna invest in your financial realm. I wanna invest in your financial place too, but I also wanna invest in your soul. So don't go out to eat if you're broke and you can barely afford the meal. Go out to eat when you can budget for a big tip. Because I, I remember this, um, uh, this one episode where um, some celebrities were actually going out to coffee and they were going out to, uh, to lunch and dinner. And, and uh, one of the conversations that broke out was over the tip that they left. And this guy, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld, this guy said, oh, you're going to leave that kind of a tip? And, and Jerry said, yeah, don't you know who they see us to be? We're celebrities. We probably have a little bit of money in the bank. If I leave a small tip, what's that going to say about us? So he said, I'm going to leave a big one so that they, they know that I want to invest in them. And I'm thinking, Christians are celebrities. You are from another world. You're from heaven. And last time I checked, heaven was full of abundance. So put the tip on the table, love on the person, especially when they do a bad job. And just let them know, hey, sweetie, come here. I know you're new at this, Okay. But let me just give you a tip. I'm going to drop a lot of money here. I love you. I want to invest in you, but I need you to listen to me for a second. And then you leave, and then you just benefited both their pocketbook and their soul. Come on, somebody catching this? We need to go out and speak life and speak life. The problem is we have this mentality that disciples did. Uh, disciples had the conversation with Jesus. Jesus, <laughs> send these guys away. Uh, they're hungry, and, and you just need to give them back to their cities, to their villages, so that they can go get something to eat. Jesus looks at them and says, you feed them. You feed them. The God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, just passes over, and he goes, here you go, buddy. You got this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Wait, 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 let me breathe for a second. You want me to do the impossible? You want me to be the answer to prayer to someone? You want me to go deliver words of life that's gonna change a person's history? Absolutely. And we do that by simply just listening to what God's saying to us and giving it out. But that's not what the disciples said. Listen to what they said. After the conversation goes on, hey, Jesus, send them away. Jesus said, no, you feed them. The disciples said, we only have, did you catch that? We only have. They're looking at what they lack instead of the word that God's given them. Hey, feed them. No, no, we only have. Hey, wouldn't you love to have a marriage? Yes, but you know, my spouse is like, no, no, no. Didn't you hear what I said? Everything that God has given you for a successful, healthy, abundant, filled life. It's going to be difficult at times. But everything that God has given you is going to be inside the Holy Spirit and inside of his word. He never tells you to go in a, in a direction that he doesn't equip you to go there. Man, I, I wish I had better relationships. You can. Stop having the poverty mentality. Stop thinking that you lack. You don't lack. Instead of having the disciples mentality, well, we only have five. What do we have? Five fish, two loaves of bread. Come on. How is that to so many people that are here? Here we are again with a big problem. Have you ever been around those people? Hey, we got a big project. Oh, finally, we're gonna fail on this one like we did last one. Can you stop talking, you know? Like you got some people on your project that are just like that. At some point in time, we just need to realize that the ideas that they speak of are just coming from the abundance of their heart and something needs to change. So come on, let's change our conversation by changing what we listen to. Let's be filled up with God. Let's be filled up with this truth because God is allowing us to work some impossible situations like feeding thousands of people by simply taking care of the ones that are right in front of you. He's not asking you to take care of the city. He's just asking you to take care of the ones that are in your city. Look to the ones, speak life into them. Speak grace and see that you won't see some life change. Verse 20, let's keep going down. And they all eight, come on, don't miss these words, at 5,000 plus women plus children, they all ate, and what's it say? And were satisfied. 
This is a good word. I think it's a Thanksgiving or something. Come on, guys. Think about the last meal in which you left uh, fully satisfied at the table. When was the last time you ate and you were satisfied? There is nobody in their right mind who would go to a buffet with an exorbitant amount of food and leave hungry. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I like that. That was a guy right there. I love it. <laughs> I think I woke him up. Now you're talking my language, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Glad to have you. So whenever we get into this mentality of, of buffet line, there's food out all over the place. There's food out all over the place. God wants you to eat up. It, you didn't find anything there? Just keep traveling. You don't like the poems? That's cool. Get some Proverbs. You don't like the Proverbs? Go to some Gospels because you're going to find a word that's timely, that's rich, that heals you, that gives you encouragement. And then you tuck that away and now go give it to some other people. Man, you need some encouragement. How do I know? Because you're spitting everything but encouragement to me. Let me give you a dish of this. Let me be patient with you. Let me listen to you. Let me speak grace to you. I'm not going to answer where you are. I'm going to give you what you need. Because I'm listening to you, and based on what you need, I'm going to give that word to you. And it'll benefit and build up those who listen. The disciples were sitting here with this situation, and they said, um, man, God, you got to do a miracle. You have to do the impossible. You have to supply these needs. And the disciples were looking to Jesus while Jesus was looking to you. Sometimes the greatest miracle ever is you just showing up. Sometimes before you can see the spiritual break through your life, the natural needs to be broken through first. Sometimes before you can actually see the conversation mull through with your spouse, you need to just step in and start engaging your spouse in a conversation. Before the conversation can end with a coworker, it needs to start with just you showing up. Before the impossible happens, the possible is started with you being there. Speak the words, give life, so that we can actually give what will satisfy and have some leftovers. I love verse 20 because it says, all were satisfied, all ate and were satisfied. And keep reading, keep reading, check it out. It says, there was 12 baskets Filled, filled with broken pieces, 12 baskets. Did you do the math? Five loaves of bread, two fish, 5,000 men plus women plus children. They all ate and were satisfied and had 12 baskets filled with broken pieces, leftovers. I don't know about you, but as a kid, I hated leftovers. Come on, anybody else? As a kid, did you guys just despise, come on, Johnny, you just despise leftovers? Like as a kid, the leftovers, whenever my parents said, hey, we're having leftovers, leftovers would be up in the nasty category, close to mold. Like we're talking, there's mold on the cheese. Throw it away. Just get rid of it. No, no, you just scrape it off. No, no you don't. No, you don't. My grandma once told me, that's how cheese is made. No, 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 no. <laughs> what I don't know will kill me or something like that. <laughs> And so you go, you go through this process of being like, oh my gosh, this is really going to be the death of me. I, I, I don't like leftovers at all. As a kid, I just despised them. And so um, I, don't, I don't know what it was, but the maturity of my palate and the maturity of my budget as a father, come on somebody, I love leftovers now. <laughs> so good. Like some of, the, some of the music to my ears, my wife would be like, hey, we're going to double this uh, dinner tonight, and, and you're going to have it for lunch the next week. <laughs> and I say, I say, do you see this? It's a tear of joy. Right? <laughs> leftovers, man. They're so good. I love me some leftovers. The disciples had leftovers when they first thought that they had lack. Church, can I tell you? There's a famine outside of your door. There's a famine outside of the relationships that you have. And God doesn't want you to do everything. He just wants you to take the little bit that you have and supply it, give it away so that you can see the impossible happen and there will be leftover for your soul, leftover for your mind, leftover for your family, leftover for everybody else where you can go out from a restaurant and just have leftovers and just 
Give food, give food, give food, give food. I'm satisfied. I ate. Here, have some. It was amazing. I would highly recommend this restaurant to you. Here, have a bite. Here, check this out. This is what we had as an appetizer. This is the main dish. And just keep giving out 12 baskets filled with leftovers. There is plenty for everybody. But sometimes we, 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 we don't give because we feel like we lack. Don't let what you don't have be able to give what you do have. Come on, let's not let what we don't have be able to give what we do have. God hasn't given you all the answers, but he's given you some. Get inside the word and so that your soul is satisfied and you can give those out. Because you start, you start with something small. Words are small. The words are tiny. You know, James actually says that the tongue and the words that we speak are sometimes small, but they make great boasts. It's like this. Let me make the correlation, James says. The words in your tongue to the mouth is almost like the small rudder in a really, really big ship making sure that it goes where it's supposed to. Or if you don't get that analogy, it's like a spark, a small, tiny spark that sets a forest ablaze on fire. That is the power of words. So if you don't think it's much, if you think it's insignificant, take the word of God, take his truth, his grace, his love, his mercy, his stories, and start giving them away a little bit at a time so that you can spark a forest fire of God's love everywhere around you. In Jesus' name. You know, if you've been with us for the past couple weeks, we've been showing you parsing together a video in which the main character has been seeing opportunities to speak life and to see light opportunities and use this platform for good at home and at work. And so as promised, this is going to progressively uh, add more to the story. So this is week number three. You guys ready to see the video? Week number three. Check this out. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Do you ever wonder what the conversation was between the main character and the boy at work? It's a three, four, maybe five second conversation. And you see the, the little boy just light up. You ever wonder what was, what was passed back and forth? Or what about the conversation with the, the main character and the homeless man? You ever wonder what they, what they were talking about? I bet you they were words of life. I bet you they were life-giving, grace-filled words that don't take much, they're just small. The changes that God has done in you, maybe you can just start to give those away.